This is Amateur Logic, episode 70 for September 15th, 2014. The Arduino Antenna Switcher. This episode of Amateur Logic is brought to you by Gigaparts.com. Through October 31st, use the promo code ALTV Comet to save 10% off regularly priced Comet products and get a free gift with your order. Only at Gigaparts.com. MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at MFJEnterprises.com. And by ICOM. And the 2014 D Star QSO Party, September 19th through 21st. Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 70. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. And it's great to be back with you again. I always say that. And I always say that I always say that, don't I? Yeah. You always mean it, though, don't you? I do mean it. It is good to be back. Yeah, it is. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Well, what have you been up to, Tommy? Well, I've been having a good time, man. I've got a new toy, uh, MFJ Parabolic Dish uh, Ultrasonic Receiver. So I got out and played with that this month. Yeah. Peter, what about you? Well, two things. Uh, First, the uh, DATV QSO party was on, which I participated in. That was good fun, and we'll see a bit of that later. And uh, the uh, the downside, though, the other thing is that um, I had an external hard drive kind of blow up on me. (laughs) So uh, I'm faced with the problem of how best to try to uh, salvage the data from that. I think we've all had that done at some stage. Yeah, I've I've had hard drives crash, and yeah, everybody's had it happen, and you never really seem to be backed up. And and it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Yeah, it's just when. Yeah, it's yeah. just a yeah. matter of when. Uh, do you guys back up? I must admit I didn't, and so uh, I, you know, I'm going to have to uh, probably might have to spend some money to uh, to actually get it done professionally. We'll, we shall see. Yeah, I I back up some of my stuff, but uh, you know. It, whenever I have a crash, obviously there was something I didn't back up that I should have. Yeah, I don't, I don't do a proper full backup, but if yeah. I have something critical, I actually store it either in the cloud or on a, a, a separate drive or yeah. on one of my other computers. Yeah. Well, the I'm trouble gonna... is if you've got video footage, right, which is big, you'll actually use up a lot of bandwidth uh, uploading it. So yeah. uh, cl- that's the problem with cloud storage, that uh, uh, it's, it's a bandwidth issue. We actually have the Amateur Logic episodes dating all the way back to episode one archived in two places. I've got mm-hmm. several hard drives over here with uh, Amateur Logic footage on it. Just the completed shows. I don't have the B-roll. And then Tommy's got a copy of all of it, too. Right. Yeah. So. Have you been keeping any of the B-roll? I mean, I no. on that hard drive, I actually had B-roll going back to the first show that I was involved in. So uh, it's rather important that I actually get that. Good for bloopers. Yeah, well, no, I, I can't, unfortunately. You know, all the shows run at least an hour, and that's mm. that's a lot of video. There's there's no way I could. I can't even keep all the episodes on on my computer. I, I keep about the, I don't know, five to ten latest episodes on there, and everything else I have to offload. Yeah, they're, they're huge, man. Uh, you know, used to we struggled coming up with an hour of material, mm-hmm. and now... It's a struggle to get it, get it anywhere even near an yeah. hour. We're always over. Yeah. Mm. But that's okay. You know, just uh, a little bit more time downloading or uploading. Mm. And fortunately, the Internet's gotten a little faster. So. Oh, yeah. Not, yeah, that's great. Not as big a problem as it was nine years ago. Yeah. But I, I don't back all the video up to the cloud, Peter. I, I put a few things mm-hmm. on YouTube just peddling around, but uh, those go on yep. an extra hard yeah. drive. Well, I've been in North Carolina this week, and, uh, well, it's actually last week now, but I just got back uh, yesterday after lunch working up there at a radio station. It's a pretty nice area up there. I'd never been there before. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. I go there quite often. Yeah. I'm going there tomorrow. Are you? 
fly into Charlotte and then drive down to South Carolina. Well, I just came back from Charlotte, so I could have met you in the airport. We could have just done the show right there. That would have been cool. Yeah. I screwed up when I booked my trip, though. I, I flew out uh, this past Tuesday. I should have booked it so that I got there on Saturday because they had uh, the big Shelby Ham Fest up there. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that's a good one, too. Yeah, that's what I've heard, too. So maybe mm -hmm. one year we'll get to that one. This year will be the 70th anniversary of the VOA Bethany Transmission Site. To commemorate the 70th anniversary, we'll be having a special event on Saturday, September the 20th, with the Westchester Amateur Radio Club. Yeah. Right. You know, we visited there, uh, what was it, two years ago now? Yeah, we actually went back this year, too. Yeah, we actually went back, and we haven't shown you that footage we got there this year yet. It's, it's a special treat, and we need to get that on out before... Uh, Dayton comes around again. Yeah, they might not let us back in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a, a a great site there. And if you haven't seen it, go back and watch the uh, VOA special on Amateur Logic. We really got a good tour of that place and a little bit of footage of the Ham Shack on there too. So, yeah, I'm going to try to try to catch that special event and yeah, see that's going to be working. Me, yeah, me too. But, yeah. uh, that's a that's a really an awesome place. If you ever get up near Dayton, you really need to go by there and see it. You do. You really do. How close is it? The how close is the site to Dayton? Uh, about thirty minutes. Yeah, about that. Yeah. So oh, that's not far. Yeah, well within driving distance, and they usually do a, a tour either there or over at the WLW transmitter. If not every year, every few years. Yeah, well, both of them are very impressive. Oh yeah, and they're right beside each other. So. Uh, a lot of history going on there. Well, let's get on into the emails. Tommy, I think you're number one this time. I do. From Steve, WB4IZC. Steve's from Horn Lake, Mississippi. Wow. Said, Tommy, I'd like to thank you for producing a great DV Mega video. It was very informative. I'm in the process of building a D-Star repeater system here in Horn Lake, Mississippi. In your Mega video, you mentioned using a Wi-Fi dongle with your Pi. Would you mind telling me which brand and model you have found that works well? Um, well, uh, I've got the, uh, the the dongle I've got is the, I've got a DV access point, plus I also have the DV Mega. Uh -huh. uh, and I'll, that's the newest one, and, and they both worked very well. Um, I, I actually like both of them. Um, kind of a little bit more partial to the DV Mega, I think. From the, of the other one, I just kind of like the form factor, and it doesn't use the extra USB. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh -huh. Well, Peter, what have you got? Okay, yeah, I've got an email here from Ed uh, VK2JI, and uh, I, Ed says that uh, he uh, saw my segment about the KNQ7A uh, 40 meter transceiver build, and he's built the 20 meter version of that, and uh, two other Central Coast. ARC members, and hi to all the CCARC members out there, uh, built the 40 metre version. And uh, he says that um, the big disadvantage, as you said, is that there's no frequency readout and the frequency range is limited. Uh, one of the few YL operators in Sydney wrote a piece in the AR magazine, that's Amateur Radio magazine last year, on her modifications to the kit. She's added digital readout through a DDS board, which also gives full band coverage and added an internal mains PSU. That is a nice mod there. Well, I've Thanks, got... Ed. Yeah, I've got one here. It, it came from our buddy, Ted Randall, who we had on from the Huntsville show. <laughs> and Ted said that his uh, son, Matt, the chief engineer for Dave Ramsey, did a short video skit but he turned it into a ham radio thing it was supposed to be about behind the scenes on the dave ramsey show but oh yeah he managed to sneak ham radio in there good going matt he thought that our viewers might find it interesting here's a link right here if you'd like to go see that matt aaron the chief engineer for dave ramsey i watched it it was pretty funny it was it's yeah good. yeah i like it's it wor too. worth worth a look yeah well peter what have you got this month? Well, uh, it's just we've just finished the uh, over three days the DATV uh, QSO party uh, digital amateur television. Well, this year we did a hookup with the United States, and uh, we also had a few guys uh, join in from uh, the UK. 
Unfortunately, due to sound problems, uh, a lot of the uh, UK footage had to be cut out, and I apologise for that. But uh, it was a great uh, hookup uh, once again, and um, sort of uh, 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 here's a, a summary of the footage. Okay, I think we're all there, and uh, good evening everyone, and welcome to the uh, fourth DATV uh, QSO party. Okay, I see I'm on uh, RTV1 now. This is Don, KE6BXT, and we are still trying to keep our eyes open at uh, 3 o'clock a.m. here in uh, Mission Viejo, Hill, California. My... Uh Next bit of uh, show and tell is my uh, DATV Express, which I've got over here. This is the, uh, the US UK project, and it's basically a, a, a single board. And there it is, there. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Peter, uh, VK3PB. Now, I've decided to uh, pre record my uh, ATV transmission this year. Mainly because I'm pretty busy getting hey, stuff ready to uh, hey, hey, go hey, overseas hey, shortly. Hey. Uh, How about you tell them the what real are you doing here? reason why you're pre-recording it? If you're not, I will. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, VK 580M. Yeah, good day, everyone. From Nick, VK 3CH in Northcote. I'll just adjust the height on this a bit. That's it. And thanks once again for allowing him to, allowing me, I should say, to uh, be part of the uh, ATV QSO party. And uh, it would appear from discussion with Peter this afternoon that I'm, I'm it and down VK7. I think this is a uh, fourth um, ATV party, so we're starting to get a bit of a rig along. And um, thanks, Peter, for the uh, modifications to the. Uh, ATV transmitter since uh, the new PA has gone in and the new antennas uh, reports across Melbourne have been um, excellent and uh, so much easier to run multiple receivers and record and uh, other, su other such things. Um, Good David. Oh, thank you. VK3 JDA David, um, fourth year uh, as part of the QSO party. Oh, I'll just turn that down. Fourth year part of the QSO party, first year uh, actually being able to transmit uh, from my shack. Good evening everybody, this is VK3DQ in uh, sunny one Turner South and uh, sitting beside me, uh, I'll let her tell you who she is. I'm Jean, VK3VIP. I'm just, uh, this is uh, John, VK3ATV. Okay, <clears throat> very good. And that... Uh, well, we got uh, the repeater here at uh, WR8ATV uh, repeater in Columbus, Ohio. This is Gary, Columbus, two R's, A-R-R-Y, CXI, November 8, Charlie X-Ray, India, and uh, I'm in Northeast Columbus, Ohio. Good evening, Austin. We're 16 miles northwest of Columbus, Ohio. A little bird called Plain City, where the Mennonites live, running uh, just a TC70-10 uh, transmitter and an amplifier there on, uh, name is J, J-A-Y, Caldwell, C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L, -L, and we're a retired broadcast engineer that works for the CBS affiliate here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. W-A-R-U-T, my name is Ken, and I'm located about 20 miles uh, north of uh, Columbus. Uh, been in uh, actually amateur television since 1969, so I'm still the young guy in town. Uh, I run uh, pretty much all the modes of TFFM, 
and, uh, and pretty much uh, all the way through tenure here. So that's the story here. So we are in the center room. Can we wait for you to? Uh, where we are is the actual XYL's work, so it's just a warehouse. Um, all that stuff. Oh, here's our spare aerials. I might just put it that way. Uh, so there's some spare loops for 70 and 23 centimeters uh, receive and transmit. Uh, but we've got uh, one of those, a loop yagi exactly like that, up on the roof here above us. And uh, we've got two of these at home, one we can rotate and one that's just fixed on uh, RTV. Ah, welcome everyone to the uh, EMDRC club rooms. <clears throat> I think we, uh, we've got a cameraman here who can uh, do so at the moment. You're looking at our, um, at our antenna system. Up there we've got a, uh, I don't know what brand tri-band Yagi that one is. It just went up the other week actually. And below that is our 23 centimetre grid pack uplink. And below that again is a... Um, 70 centimetre downlink, that's what we're receiving the stuff with, and also we've got up there a couple of dipoles, 80 metres and 40 metres. This is the uh, direct downlink from uh, VK3 RTV. We can receive through a normal set top box, uh, DVB-T, and uh, we're, we're uploading DVB-S. Got a switch here so we can switch it to a few inputs, different video inputs. Below that we've got the uh, SR Systems digital, mo digital system there, that was built by Damien, VK3KQ. You'll see a few of these boxes around. We've got one open on the bench there, so later on when we have a second time round we'll show you that. And we go down below that we've got our, um, our monitor for monitoring our uplink. And next to that underneath this remote control is a tiny little um, streamer. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Good morning everybody, VK5 um, DMC Port Pirie, uh, also uh, going out via VK5 RDC, the uh, South Australian repeater, first in uh, South Australia as we like to, uh, like to say. Okay, yeah, hi, it's uh, Peter, uh, VK4EA, <coughs> pardon me, bit of a croak, and uh, greetings from a sunny Brisbane in the uh, state of Queensland in, uh, in Australia, so yeah, good day to all the... Californians, a lovely part of the world. I was over there a couple of years ago. And stayed in uh, stayed in a few different places. It's um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. And uh, yeah, VK Seven TW from uh, Hobart, uh, island state of Tasmania. Um, I uh, just a bit of background on ATV. Uh, the activity down here. Um, we. Um, uh, we're associated with the Radio and Electronics Association of uh, Southern Tasmania, which is the club down here. Today, you need a helicopter and line-of-sight antenna to cover car racing. But the NDS system delivers superior pictures directly to a receiving system over four miles away. Think of what it can do for coverage of other sports events, such as marathons and powerboat racing. This, this evening, well, uh, what a, an interesting session. I, uh, a few gremlins, but I expect that's to be uh, expected in the, uh, in the best of uh, households. Uh. Yeah, I can hear myself coming through in the other room now, so <laughs> I know the audio's getting through at least. I don't know if the audio's going to get through from the repeater, but uh, I'll give it a go. And the ATV okay. stuff does look like a lot of fun. I'd, I'd like to try that. Yeah, you know, I've got a friend that promised me a UHF TV exciter, and we've just never gotten together and, and gotten it and uh, or really got a place to put it up yet. But, yeah, yeah we ought to try that out. Do you, do you have any hills nearby that you could um, stick a repeater on or anything higher you know, like that? To, Man, it helps it's, if you've got it's, a bit flat, of it's pretty flat around here. The big thing, by the way, I should say, this year I noticed was so many stations are now using digital. Uh, often uh, people are using the, either the Digilite or the DATV Express boards, and uh, they're relatively inexpensive and will send digital amateur television. So uh, that's, a, that's a new development uh, uh, in uh, amateur TV, and uh, uh, as you can see, the video quality is just excellent. The uh, DATV look much better than the analogs. Oh, yeah. It'd be nice to try something like a, a Pico balloon launch live uh, in the midst of it. Yeah. What is a Pico balloon? Tell us about that. 
Oh, that's something I'm actually working on at the moment. It's possible to uh, buy a party balloon. You know those silver balloons that are about a metre in height? You fill them up with helium and you put a small uh, radio transmitter and a GPS and something like a small Arduino on there. Uh, so it's relatively light, uh, with a battery of course. And then you just let it uh, uh, float up in the air. It goes up eight kilometres and it will go for... Um, you know, potentially thousands of kilometres. We've got uh, a chap here, uh, Andy, VK3YT in Melbourne, who just about every second week is releasing a Pico balloon and you can track him on spacenear.us and also on APRS.5. And his balloons have floated up to uh, uh, northern New South Wales, across to uh, New Zealand, and some have even made it all the way over to Brazil, which is amazing. Yeah, that, that does sound like fun, doesn't it, Tom? Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm not sure we've got kilometers here, though, do we? No, we tried that one time, but it didn't really go yeah, over too well. It didn't take, yeah. Uh, well, well it, uh, yeah, anyway, it's, the other thing is it's a very cheap way uh, to get into ballooning. Uh, yeah, sounds economical. Yeah, it's right up my alley. Yeah. Well, right now, let's take a break and have a message from one of the people who helps make Amateur Logic possible. Need an easy-to-use antenna analyzer that you can count on? Look no further than the Comet CAA500. The CAA500 is the only analyzer in its class that covers HF through 500 megahertz, including 220. The optional soft case features a reflective shoulder strap and a belt loop that doubles as a palm grip. The smooth, precise thumb wheel lets you quickly scan the desired frequency range in seconds. A large, easy-to-read cross-needle meter displays both SWR and impedance, allowing you to track both readings simultaneously in an analog format. Rugged, dependable, precise, and accurate, the Comet CAA500 is the antenna analyzer of choice for both amateurs and professionals. Gigaparts is the largest independent amateur radio dealer in the nation. Everything you need for ham radio, including books, DVDs, antennas, rope, coax, and tuners. Gigaparts has it all and is open Monday through Saturday. Call us toll free at 866-535-4442 and our friendly staff will be happy to help you find the right products for nearly any project and budget. Online shopping made easy with real-time pricing and availability and free shipping on most orders. Go to gigaparts.com and enter to win a free radio. Have a question? Click on live chat for a quick answer. Low prices, huge selection. America's favorite ham radio store is Gigaparts. And right now through October 31st of 2014, you can save 10% on all regularly priced Comet products and get a free gift with your order when you use coupon code ALTV-COMET, only at gigaparts.com. Well, Tommy, you you said you had a special for us this week. You've got a well, yeah, I've got a new got a new toy. Yeah. Um, you've seen the uh, the MFJ ultrasonic dish that you uh -huh. use to track down power line noise. Well, I got one of those and played around with it. I've got the MFJ 5008 ultrasonic receiver, and we're going to go out and see if we can find some uh, faulty insulators or sh shorted power line and test it out. Now, I've been trying to test it out all week. I, I would take it to work with me each day and on the way home I would ride through a lot of different places and test it out. But I haven't really found any broken insulators or, or shorts or anything up there just yet. Uh, apparently the power company around here does a pretty good job of keeping that stuff under control. Uh, suspect in the winter time if we have ice and things like that it'll get worse. If I can't come up with anything this morning we're going to try to make our own arc and test it out like that. But at any rate we're going to have a good time. All of a sudden I feel the need to make my presence known. N5 ZNO Mobile. N5 ZNO. This is Casey 5 aaw Good afternoon Tommy. Good afternoon. Well I'm just about here. Let me go ahead and clear with you and uh, I'll, I'll catch you a little bit later on. I'll be back on well, I found a neighborhood with overhead service, so let's see what we can come up with. All right, we got one that looks pretty rusty. So let's see what we can hear.
Nothing on that one. Let's try these. Pretty much nothing there either. Really nothing. I wonder how long it's going to take for the police to show up. People have no idea that it's ultrasonic. You could scream into the front of it and never hear it. Not through here anyway. Time for plan B. Let's talk about why we're listening in the ultrasonic range. When you have arcing, it makes RF noise that you're going to pick up on your receiver, but it also makes an audible noise that's typically in the 40,000 hertz range. If you see the chart here, you can see that's out of the human's hearing. That's why we call it ultrasonic. Plan B means we're going to make our own arcs with a file and a battery. Okay, we're about 10 yards out, so let's give it a try. Oh yeah, loud and clear. I see smoke. Go about 20. That should be about 20. All right, hit. Oh, yeah, it's loud. No problem. Now we're gonna we're gonna check the direction, and see uh, about the rejection from the sides. So. Just do it, do it, and then I'm going to point away, and then do it, and I'm going to point away. No, nope, that killed it right there. Okay. It, it's very directional. Uh, it's getting pretty weak there. Just a little bit of scratching. I think that's going to be about it. That would be about, uh, it's about 50 yards. That's pretty good. I could have probably gone a little bit farther, but it was, the scratching was getting real light. As far as it being directional, the pattern on it's very tight. You could see when we pointed just a few degrees off that it dropped down significantly. Now I've relocated over here to the backyard studios and we're gonna just play around a little bit and show you a few more things about the dish. We got about 100, 120 feet out of the ultrasonic receiver. It's a pretty fun little tool to play with. I did find out that the local power company uses something very similar to track down insulator problems and arcing problems on the power lines around here. So that, that tells you it's a good tool for the job. Well, it, in playing around with it, I also found out that you can hear a lot of other things with it. Now, if you'll listen, you can hear there's a lot of crickets, a lot of bugs around here. This is Mississippi. It, we grow a bumper crop of them every year. So, get a little sound of that. Let's switch over to the dish here. There's some holes here that you line up. If you look through it and put it right on what you want to check, they're very accurate. The documentation says 12 inches at about 50 feet out, and that's about right. I've tested it. and We did it earlier, as you saw. So what we're going to do is just kind of point it around and see what we can find in the yard. One thing that's kind of weird, and feel sorry for your dogs, is it rained here all day yesterday, so the grass is kind of damp and it's soft, and listen to it as I walk across it. Now 
So let's see what else we can find. Those bugs, as we heard, they're around. You hear them on the ground? The pattern on this thing is so tight, sometimes it's a little difficult to pinpoint them. But once you get on one, you can tell exactly where it is. So you can pick up a lot of things with it. I also thought about, you know, if I do it outside and it works, it picks up uh, interference from power lines and things like that. What if I tried it inside? I remember Gordon West saying that electric dimmers are a common source of problems on HF in the house. Well, I actually stood back in the room and pointed it at my dimmer switch in my living room and I could hear noise coming out of that thing and I moved off just a hair and it went away so I guess theoretically you could use it in the house to actually pinpoint some sources of noise as well. It's kind of ironic that I've been looking for a week for a source of power line noise and I haven't really found anything and I went to a ball game the other night for my son's football team he coaches and I stood up near the fence and all of a sudden I heard a pop and sparks fell down right beside me and, and one was just I walked up on it out of the blue and didn't have my stuff with me. So anyway, I, if I do run across one close by, it'll probably be more close to wintertime, I would imagine that something like that will show up. But I'll get some footage of that and show it to you as well. But you can see from the test that we did that it works very well. And I'm kind of looking forward to having it in the toolbox for use in the future. 73. So you missed the squirrel at the end? I missed the squirrel. I, I thought I saw something go across the corner up there. I, I couldn't read the text from this far away. Oh, that, that little joker, my, my antenna is actually tied off to the leg of that treehouse thing that you saw back there, and he just ran from there. Wow. So. Near the fence, and all of a sudden I heard a pop, and sparks fell down right beside me. Yeah, I saw him, Tommy. Just a quick question. What would you use, what, what's the general use for the ultrasonic uh, listening device well what uses would you put it to in well, practical terms well it's actually made for locating power line noise all so, right so it's something that your local club might like to uh, get together some funds to buy because everybody can sort of share it around uh, that yeah, way they could, they could certainly do that it's, it's not that expensive of a device either uh, i actually kind of expect it to cost a bit more you know it's not out of the range of an individual if you got a bad power line problem and you want to pinpoint it you yeah. know I think it would be worth the investment myself. Huh. Pretty neat piece of gear, you know. I probably need a new file now, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably do. It's kind of arced up. Did it cool off yet? It cooled off, yeah. But and I owe you a piece of wire, too, don't I? You probably do, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that battery was drawing a pretty good arc on that file. But, you know, I wanted something that, you know, I could go across and it and make a lot of arcs. Uh -huh. and, and it did good for that, but there's all these little balls on it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for years, hams have relied on the world's most popular antenna analyzer, the MFJ259B. That compact battery-powered RF impedance analyzer combined four basic circuits, a 1.8 to 170 megahertz variable frequency oscillator, a frequency counter, a 50-ohm RF bridge, and an 8-bit microcontroller. Now the MFJ259 has been updated to the new MFJ259C. All the same great functions present in the 259B with an expanded frequency range. The MFJ259C covers all frequencies from 530 kHz to 230 MHz, allowing measurements all the way from the AM broadcast band through the 220 MHz amateur band. Make a wide variety of useful antenna impedance measurements, including coaxial cable loss and distance to an open or short. Primarily designed for analyzing 50-ohm antenna and transmission line systems, the MFJ259C also measures RF impedances between a few ohms and several hundred ohms. It also functions as a signal source and a frequency counter. The MFJ259C gives you a complete picture of your antenna's performance. Read antenna SWR and complex impedance, determine velocity factor, coaxial cable loss in dB, length of coax, and distance to a shorter opening feet. Read SWR, return loss, and reflection coefficient at any frequency simultaneously at a single glance. You can even read inductance and microhenries and capacitance and picofarads at RF frequencies. The large, easy-to-read two-line LC screen and side-by-side -side meters clearly display all the information you need. 
While a lot of new antenna analyzers have appeared in the market recently, none give you the flexibility and wide assortment of RF measurement capabilities the MFJ259C does. If you've been putting off getting an antenna analyzer, then you need to take a look at the new MFJ259C. Visit MFJEnterprises.com today. The MFJ259s have been around for years. You know, it's the most popular analyzer around, and they've upgraded it from the 259B to the 259C now. Yeah. Just getting a little bit better as it goes along. Yeah, I've got the B at the house. Yeah. And if you don't have one of those yourself and... You know, that's kind of one of those items that uh, really, if your friend's got one, you don't need one. Yeah, that's true. So maybe check with your club, and if they don't have one, maybe you get a few guys together and uh, and get one. Because th there needs to be one in every city in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a really handy thing. It, it's so much quicker to, to set up your antennas and check for faults mm -hmm. and such than it is, uh, you know, just using an SWR meter. Yeah. So, well worth the investment. Well, Peter, what's on your email stack next? I've got one final email here from Mike Morneau. Uh, hi, Mike. And he says, uh, subject, it's finally summer up here. The moose is in the pool. Repeat, the moose is in the pool. <laughs> Likely it's even warmer down in your neck of the woods. That sounded very coded. Uh, I actually also adds uh, current weather, <laughs> the Tuesday, August the 26th. Partly cloudy, 84 degrees Fahrenheit, 74% R.H, feels like 102. Yeah. So uh, I take it it must be somewhere over there. Yeah, 74% relative humidity. That sounds like southern humidity there. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, he's up north there, and I guess the moose gets in the pool that often. You know, <laughs> the, the moose is kind of a running joke there. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, you yeah. know. Well, of course, he's up in Canada, and uh, they yeah. have uh, extremes of weather. Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, the moose thing actually came up the time when the cat was uh, terrorizing you while you were shooting your, the uh, when we were shooting Amateur Logic, the cat yeah. kept getting in. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> uh, he's kind of started about the moose getting in the house, and yeah. it's been running ever since. Yeah, the moose came in the house for the winter and wouldn't go back out. It was so cold. Yeah, my up there. sister, my sister actually worked at uh, I think it was Banff up in Western Canada uh, for a year or two, and um, yeah, I've heard stories of the moose walking down the main street, these sort of uh, these sort of places. Yeah, you know we don't have them down here, but apparently they're big. Yeah, you don't want to mess with them. If the moose wants in the pool, you let him in the pool. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> well, I've got one here that, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. It's from uh, Team or Time. It's T E M E, and he's O H two H Q E in Finland. And he says, "Hello, old man George. What about you and Thomas come to Germany next year?" He's referring to uh, Joe Eisenberg, who went to Friedrichshafen this yeah. you know, past year for the Hamfest. He says he has a few pictures and. Um, things that Joe talked about in our bonus ALTV show on Huntsville. And uh, he says, we actually uh, met him in Friedrichshafen this summer. So, yeah, we'd love to come over there. That would be awesome. It would. That would be a great trip. And I don't know, maybe one of these years, you know, Joe said we really needed to do it. Yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. like to do that. It would be a lot of fun. Yeah, it would be. What about you, Peter? Will you meet us in Germany one year? All right. Uh, I'm up for it, so um, you guys go to Germany, I'll meet you there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, well, no, I only say that because um, uh, I've been meaning to go to Europe at some point in time, and uh, uh, my sister lives over in, um, in the UK, so uh, it actually works in uh, rather well. So, um, uh, so if uh, uh, you want to plan it for a year or two down the track, we'll, um, we'll work towards that. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Yeah. We actually got another trip we kind of Yeah, well, we want to make a trip down under, Peter. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that would be interesting. Yeah. It, um, it, uh, I, I can assure you it would be um, a very interesting place to visit. Yeah, we got to find somebody to sponsor us down there, though, to bring us in. Because yeah. Tommy's, Tommy's little fishing boat just won't make yeah, it. Yeah, it won't make it. <laughs> I got two kayaks. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it'd be kind of cool to come down there at the 10th anniversary. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah would they? Would just um, if you do come down, uh, I, I really recommend that not only do you go to the capital cities, but you get inland to the Nullarbor and uh, Ayers Rock and see the interior of the country, which is just uh, just amazing. Um, well, we're going to go uh, wherever I'll, you take us. <laughs> well, we might, might be able to work something out there, but uh, uh, but yeah, Ayers Rock uh, is very great for filming and uh, bring along your quadcopter and um, you get some great views of the uh, the rock. Cool, eh? <laughs> You're in the wrong country. Oh, wrong country. Okay. Well, this time around, I I had a I had a purpose for this project, Tommy. Yeah. You know, that's not often the case. Sometimes I just do things because I need to be just, doing something. Just because you can. But this is something I've been wanting for a long time, and I finally pulled it all together. Back in December of 2011, in episode 35, we showed you ICOM's RSBA1 software being used with an IC7200 rig. This allowed remote control of the rig via the Internet. It was particularly suited to the IC7200 because of the USB port on the rear that gave you both control and audio over a single cable. You did need to connect it to a host computer, though, at the shack location. Well, I own an IC7700. Fortunately, in version 2 of the firmware upgrade for the 7700, they added a lot of new features, like uh, improved IF passband width setting, a new waveform outline, waterfall, widescreen display, and USB mouse operation. All that was added to the Spectrum Scope, and the new audio scope feature was added that's really nice. So now you have the Spectrum Scope, as well as an audio spectrum analyzer, and a typical oscilloscope display. Nice features there. And they added a lot more to it, but one thing in particular they added was a server function for remote control stations using RSBA1. Now that's really changed the game on this rig as far as I'm concerned. There's always been an Ethernet connector on the rear, but that was only useful for updating firmware in the rig. Now it's also a remote control port, so you can connect the Ethernet jack to your local router, make a few changes in the radio menus, and you're ready to operate remote. You get control data and audio both over that Ethernet cable. And the best thing is, you don't need a computer sitting by the radio. You just plug the radio directly into your Internet router. I'm about to leave on a trip for a week, and I wanted to be able to remotely control my rig from my laptop while I was out and do a little HF at night. The one thing that concerned me though, I live in the south and it's not a good idea to go off and leave an antenna connected to your HF rig during the summertime. There's just too much lightning here. So I needed a good way that I could disconnect the antenna from the rig when it's not in use. And when it comes time for me to use it, I wanted to be able to connect the antenna remotely. Well, I did a little searching and didn't really find anything exactly like I needed on the internet. I was first thinking of an Ethernet controlled RF switch, and I think there might be a few out there, but they were way out of the ballpark of what I was willing to spend on this project. So I decided to build my own. And I thought about relays at first, but the spacing on a relay is so slim that I'm not sure I'd get a lot of lightning protection out of that. And I had this nice RF switch laying around, and I thought, maybe I can take this and an Arduino and a servo and use that. So here's what I did. I pulled out my Arduino along with an Ethernet shield and began doing some experimenting. And it looked like it was probably going to work, but I was having a little trouble reading data reliably from the Ethernet shield. So I got to thinking. You know, the IC7700 and a lot of other rigs have a voltage in the accessory port that's switched on and off when the rig's turned on and off. Why couldn't I use that? Here's my test circuit. You can see I've got the Arduino with my program running. I've got a double pole, double throw relay, although a single pole, double throw would have worked. I've got a 9 volt battery and a push button switch here to simulate the 12 volts that comes from the accessory port of my radio whenever the radio is turned on. And I've got a servo motor on top of an antenna switch. This switch is an MFJ2702. It's good from DC to 1 gigahertz. It'll handle 2kW on HF and 1kW up to 200 megahertz. Well, we're only going to be using this on HF. 
and our rig power is 200 watts. We could even run the amplifier with it and we would be okay, but I'm not going to try to run the amplifier remotely. If it was solid state, I might, but a tube out? No, I don't think so. So let's try it out here. The way I've got it hooked up, when the relay is not energized, the radio would be off. So the antenna switch is turned to the off position. I'm going to push this button to simulate turning the rig on. When I do that, the antenna switch comes over to on. When the radio is turned off, it goes back to off. And I'll have a PL259 that's been shorted to ground on this side. I'll have my antenna on this side. And on the input of the switch on the back here is where I'll connect the radio. Now, there's one problem I've got right here. If you watch the servo here when I energize it, you'll notice that there's a slight binding because the servo horn is screwed right down to the top of the antenna switch here. And so there's no slack there. And you can see the servo's at a slight angle. Now, that's because I just couldn't get my mounting bracket quite as straight as I would like it. And it also needed to be right in the center of the switch, which kind of proved to be difficult. But watch the servo twist when I energize. Now on the return trip, we'll notice there's a slight hesitation because of the binding when it tries to go back to off. So while it's working, it's not perfect. And I'm going to try to improve it by unscrewing the horn here from the antenna switch and making a piece that just kind of slips over it so that it can slide in and out as it needs to. And hopefully that's going to do the trick. Now the first thing I'm going to do to make this plastic part is get a bottle lid that's just slightly bigger than the switch knob. And that's got a little bit of slack in it, but it's pretty close to the right size. Now what I plan on doing is making a round knob like this and then cutting a slot out the middle where I can just position it down over the knob. And when it turns, it'll turn the knob, but it can still slide around as it needs to to keep from binding. So to make the slot in there, I could just make a piece of plastic the size of this and then try cutting it out, but that's not going to be very easy. It would be easier if I could mold it right to start with. So I took the bottle here, I got my mic out, and I did some measuring here of the knob and how deep it needed to be, how wide it needed to be and such. And I cut a little piece of wood, just the right size for that. And I'm going to slide that down here into the bottom of the bottle top. Then we'll take some shape lock and we'll just pack this tight with it. Let it cool till it hardens and then take it out and see if it fits. We'll probably have to do a little trimming on it, but that's okay. I put a cup of water into the microwave for one minute and it's at 170 degrees right now. We need it to be 150, so we'll let that cool just a moment. And then we're going to put the shape lock in there. I've got my piece of wood super glued into the plastic cup here. It looks like that's going to hold, so let's get our shape lock out and determine how much of this we're going to need. This is pretty good stuff, and Radio Shack also sells another brand of it. I don't remember the name of it right off. But just these little plastic pellets here that have a 150 degree melting temperature. So we'll fill up the cap here. And we know there's some air space in there, so we're going to throw in a little extra. So I'm thinking that should be enough right there. And if it's more than we need, we can always trim off the excess and just throw it back in the bag like I did these other pieces here because this stuff is reusable. So we're about 155 degrees or so there. I'm going to go ahead and put the pellets in now. And we'll leave those in there for a few minutes. What we're expecting is they're white right now, but as they warm up, they'll turn clear and they'll kind of clump together. Then it's pliable and we can work with it. Let's pull it out with a non-plastic instrument here and kind of mold the stuff together a little bit. Now let's take the stuff and push it down in our mold. And I can't tell by looking here 
whether it got in good around the wood or not. There's a little water down in there and that kind of makes things look a little funny. So we'll just let it cool and then we'll pull it out and see what we got and if we don't like it we'll just warm it up and do it again. Here's our completed knob. Looks pretty good. This is actually the second take out of it. The first time I did it Apparently I didn't have enough of the plastic beads in there and it didn't come around the ends here very well. It would have worked, but I took it and threw the plastic back in the water, added a few more beads, and then recast it. And this time it came out, I would say, almost perfect. It's good and solid. It's not going to break. And it fits right over our switch knob perfectly. So now the next step, I'm going to take the horn off of the servo and this is the horn the little part that spins around and I'm going to put it on top of our knob here drill the holes and mount it on there with screws I've mounted the knob to the horn of the servo got everything assembled and I was careful that when I slip it down over the handle here that the servo does have room to travel because you know these things only go so far and it looks like we're in good shape on that. So now the next stage is going to be to mount the servo to the switch above it right there. Well, it took a little bit of doing and a lot of tools and parts, but I think I finally got it here like I want it, or as close as I'm going to get it. Here's the knob that I built, and you can see I've got it slid right down on top of the lever for the antenna switch there, and there's a little bit of gap around it, so it should be able to slide good on either side. I've got the servo mounted on the original bracket that I had built and I put another bracket here on the other side to hold it from twisting and I just got these little straps right here at Lowe's and that's what I use for that. You can see the servo is sitting a little crooked there but that's what it took to get it to line up on the ends here to where it would be level. And there's enough gap in there that this thing can slide a little bit and shouldn't get in a bind. So let's try it out here. I've reset the values in my servo program so that it knows where off and on should be in degrees. So right now it's in the off position. Let's switch it to the on position. And you can see it went right to on. It's all the way on on. And you didn't see a big jerk there on the servo when it got there this time. If I release it, it ought to go right back to off. And that was good and smooth too. And it is all the way on off. So I've got my values right. It looks like the servo is working well now. It's not getting in a bind. And I think that's going to do the trick. So now all that remains to be done is uh, to take all this stuff and put it on a perf board. And connect it to my rig. So when I'm out of town... I can have the rig power up and automatically turn on the antenna. When I get through talking, I can turn off the rig remotely and the antenna gets disconnected as well. So that's the mechanics of my servo controlled antenna switch. Next time we'll take a look at the electronics and the software. What do you think, Tommy? That's pretty awesome. That it, that, it works. Yeah. It really works. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And, you, and you tried it while you were gone, huh? I did. I did. I actually uh, used it when I was in uh, North Carolina last week. I talked a few nights, and it was neat, you know, being able just to fire up the laptop there, connect to my machine. I uh, say my machine. Connect to my rig. I didn't have to have a computer on here in the shack. Yeah. Using the RSBA1 yep. before we showed. And uh, it's just like being in the shack here. I mean, I had my HF rig. I was hearing all the people I normally hear because my antenna was, was right here where it normally is. I uh, checked in on uh, one of the uh, Ham Nation after show nets. So, so your rig is off, uh -huh. but you still can log into it with the with that RSBA1 software yeah. and turn it on. So there's still a little piece of it that's still powered on, apparently. Yeah, uh, on that uh, 7700, when you, once you do the firmware update, you go in and put your IP information into it. Um, when you go to turn off the rig when you hit the power button and turn it off a little menu pops up do you want to put it in standby to wait for a connection or 
power all the way down. Oh. And if you choose to go into standby, then the power light just sits there and kind of flashes. The rig is shut off in effect, but it's listening to see if anybody's connecting. Oh. And you can have several different logins on there. So, you know, I could set you up one too. Oh, that's cool. So when you're traveling, you could log in and, and do it. Nice. But, um, awesome. You, you just take your laptop, run the software, tell it to connect, rig powers up, and you know, there's 12 volts coming out of that accessory port there. And that just runs my little Arduino circuit. So the antenna turns on and we're ready to go. And when I'm finished uh, on the software, I just say shut down the rig and disconnects the antenna and everything. Slow. So, yeah. Worked out like I had hoped. You know, that's not always the case. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a nice job. Well, thanks. It was, um, it was a, a fun project. And I'm going to take that one a little bit further. Yeah. You know, I, I blew up uh, one pin on my Arduino in the process. Of, been there, done that. Yeah. Save the Arduino. <laughs> yeah. Save the Arduino. I, I found a video you can watch that'll tell you about yeah, how to they, fix it. You yeah. should look at that. I, I think I will. As a matter of fact, I've already ordered a couple of Arduino chips. Cool. And a few other components. Plan on blowing out some more? No, not planning on blowing out some more, but I, I plan, you know, I only have one Arduino, and I plan on doing some more stuff with it. So I think I'm going to take some of these parts I bought and build an Arduino, scale down to just what I need for this project. Oh, excellent. So it'll be less parts yeah. on it. Well, right now I think it's probably time we paid a few bills, Tommy. Uh, yeah, let's do that. It'll pay for my Arduinos that I blew up. <laughs> Mark your calendars, D-Star fans. The D-Star QSO party is this month and you're invited. Connect with the world via D-Star repeaters from Friday, September 19th through Sunday, September 21st. Contact ham radio operators around the world using D-Star. D-Star has helped amateur radio grow. It's an exciting technology that has introduced new people to the hobby. And it's been a great protocol for MCOM, too. Join the D-Star QSO party and communicate through D-Star repeaters. The more QSOs you make, the more chances you have to win. Multiply your chances of collecting points when you contact a set number of foreign countries. Earn up to one bonus point when you send GPS information indicating communication distance via the D-Star radio. Submit an approved log to be eligible for the prize drawing. Visit ICOM America's website for complete contest rules, log reporting, and more. The D-Star QSO party winners will receive a brand new ID-51A ICOM 50th Anniversary Limited Edition radio. Ten lucky winners will be randomly selected. Winners can only receive one prize and cannot choose the radio color. Only 5,000 ID-51A units are available worldwide. The radio is available in five colors. Blue, green, red, white, and black. Special edition radio features include faster data transfer on DV mode, RS-MS1A Android app compatibility, additional D-plus reflector link commands, and other enhanced digital features. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on the 2014 D-Star QSO party and the 50th anniversary limited edition ID-51A. So what about it, Tommy? Are you going to get in on the QSO party? Oh yeah, I'm going to give it a try. Yeah, sounds like yeah. fun. Yeah, if if I'm around, I think I will be. Yeah. So I think last year I was out of town and missed out on it. Well, but you've got everything you need to do it out uh, of town. Which wasn't where I could do that. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this year I'm trying, planning on giving it a try. Cool. Well, you, you know, do you remember our friend John Amadeo? Oh yeah. 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 Uh, he's a producer on Last Man Standing. Yeah, I love that show. We're about to start the new season. Yeah. And. He sent us a little video here. They've got a special event coming up there that the Papa System is going to be doing. Hi, everybody. John Amadeo, NN6JA here. I'm the producer of Last Man Standing, starring Tim Allen, and I've worked in the entertainment industry for about 30 years. Hollywood has always had a relationship with amateur radio. Over the years, there have been lots of movies and TV shows featuring ham radio. Sometimes, ham radio operators are the butt of jokes. Hello, hello. This is W6XRL4. Come in, come in. And sometimes, ham radio operators are shown helping to save the world. Some of you may know that on our show, Last Man Standing, Tim Allen's character, Mike Baxter, is a ham. Mike, KA0XTT. Just a little shout out. Anybody having a good time here on Thanksgiving? <laughs> Anybody hiding in their basement to avoid their relatives? 
<laughs> of course, Mike Baxter's license is not real, and the KA0 XTT call sign is fictitious. But there are a number of real licensed amateur radio operators on our crew. In 2012, the Last Man Standing crew hosted members of the Southern California based Papa Repeater System and representatives of the Disney Amateur Radio Interconnect. While they held their special radio event, K6H, Hollywood Celebrates Ham Radio. Thank you, uh, you're five and nine in Studio City. And this is K6H. I uh, got you at five nine here on the set of uh, Last Man Standing. It was so much fun, we decided to do it again. K6H could not be held in a more appropriate location. Last Man Standing shoots on historic Stage 9 on the CBS Studio Center lot in Studio City, California. Movie stars like Roy Rogers, John Wayne, Joan Crawford, and Barbara Stanwyck grace the stages here on the lot. Over the years, such TV classics as Gunsmoke, Gilligan's Island, Bob Newhart, and The Mary Tyler Moore Show were all shot here. More recent hit shows produced on the lot were CSI New York, Will and & Grace, and of course, Last Man Standing. We hope you'll join us on Sunday, September 28th from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Pacific. We'll be on HF, VHF, UHF, D-Star, IRLP, and Echolink. Check the PAPA website at www.papasys.com for frequencies and updates. The Season 4 premiere of Last Man Standing airs on ABC Friday, October 3rd at 8 p.m., 7 p.m. Central. That's another one of those events we're going to have to check out, Tommy. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, I love, I, I can't pass up, it's Hamnado, you see, guess Ham you NATO, saw that. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of play off of Sharknado. Yeah, which, uh, and Sharknado too. Yeah. I haven't watched that yet. Uh, my wife's cousin told me I needed to, to see oh, that you, show. Yeah, you, you didn't see one or two? Uh-uh. Oh, man. Is it worth watching? Yeah. Everybody right. got to see it at least once. <laughs> Is that a requirement? It's, a, it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, well, I would think so. Yeah. yeah. I, I can't recall having seen it down here in Australia. Um, uh, maybe uh, one of my fellow VKs will correct me on that, but uh, I haven't seen it on free to air TV down here. It's, uh, it's on the Sci Fi channel. It's a Sci Fi original. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's. Finish off our emails here for the evening. Tommy, you've got another one over there, don't you? Yeah, I do. So I've got an email from Chris, NY0S. Greetings, Tommy. I recently turned in the cable box for one of my TVs and installed a Roku HDMI dongle. When I brought it up, I saw a channel called Amateur Logic. Could it be for amateur radio? What a treat. But I have to ask you to stop making shows. <laughs> uh, I had been thinking about making an Arduino project. I watched some episodes featuring Arduino that motivated me to finally buy one. Also been thinking about a Raspberry Pi project. A couple more episodes and I bought a Raspberry Pi. Now I'm looking at getting an MFJ antenna analyzer, a new ICOM radio, and a bunch of stuff from Gigaparts to put it all together. <laughs> Way to go! <laughs> so please stop inspiring me to get more gear before my wife sees the credit card statement and make no more shows. You guys are doing a great job of performing a valuable service for amateur radio community. Anyway, I thought you might be interested in this and may want to mention VirtualBox in one of your episodes. Uh, thanks and keep up the great work. Uh, yeah, you know, I think I touched base on VirtualBox back when we were doing the Linux thing, but yeah. that might, re might uh, require going back and, and looking at that again. That's a good tool. Yeah. I, is that the one I'm using? Yeah. Yes, it is. It I'm, is. It's I've great. got it on here. Uh -huh. You know, I've got is, a. Uh, is that is that for running Linux in Windows or Windows in Linux? Either either way, it's just a virtual machine uh, software, oh, okay. and you can you can boot up whatever you want inside of it. Yeah, I've got it on okay. my notebook over here. You know, it's a 64-bit uh, uh, with Windows 8.1 on it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm hoping yeah. Windows 9 is going to be better. But I needed to run some old 16-bit programs, and I put VirtualBox on there and installed Windows XP in it, and works like a champ, man. Yeah, it, the it, the client will run on Windows, Mac, Linux, or whatever, and you can host pretty much anything in it off of whatever yeah. host operating system you want to run it on. Really neat stuff. Well, I've got one more email here, and this comes from Dave. N9HF. Dave says in the last episode of Amateur Logic, you talked about using an AM tower after local sign off. He said, I had an opportunity to do this back in the mid 1990s. He worked with uh, Wisconsin Public Broadcasting as a transmitter operator. 
And they had one AM station in the network. It was WLBL in Auburndale, Wisconsin. And he says tower was 550 feet tall, which is a little tall for an AM. They're, they're not yeah. usually that tall, so it must have been a low frequency. And needless to say, it uh, really made the TS-520S come alive when he jumpered it around the ATU, the antenna tuning unit. It heard very well, but unfortunately the main lobe, as they figured out, was mostly straight up. So it only got worse as it went up in frequency. So he's saying uh, we played with the setup for about three hours in the morning and then called it quits. Long story short, if you're going to try it, stay on 160 meters and 80 meters, or most of your RF will be going straight up and not out. So, yeah, that is a good point, you know. Get closer to the um, wavelength of the actual frequency that you're working, you'll be better. But if you go up in the higher bands, yeah, it's, right. it's no telling what you're doing with it. Yeah. Yeah, not, not necessarily a real good radiator on 20 meters and up. Right. So, I, uh, I guess... Tommy, we're going to have to talk a little bit about this rig we're going to give away here. Yeah, we need to get rid of this stuff because it's kind of blocking my room here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've got a great contest coming up here for uh, those who were not aware of it and for those who are. You need to go enter. It's the Amateur Logic 9th Anniversary Contest with great prizes from ICOM, they've got the IC7100 HF VHF UHF radio with D Star. Uh, we're also given a, a Maritron SDC 104 antenna tuner from MFJ. Well, what's it going to tune? It's going to tune a little Tar Heel HD screwdriver antenna that's also being supplied by MFJ. You know, they're a distributor for Tar Heel. Mm -hmm. We got some prizes from Comet and Giga Parts here. Comet's going to give us a CA 2 before SR broadband VHF UHF antenna. Comet and Gigaparts are also going to give us an HD 5 3 8 24 universal HD antenna lip mount. And the Comet CPM 5 universal antenna lip mount is going to come for the other antenna. So, in all, you're going to get the HF radio. You're going to get antenna, the screwdriver antenna. You're going to get a dual band antenna. You're going to get an antenna tuner and the mount. So it's everything you need. Yeah, it's a pretty full package. Tell us a little bit about that radio over there, Tommy. Man, this is the uh, IC7100 that's uh, got the new touch screen, uh, HF, and uh, all modes, HF, VHF, UHF. Uh, I believe it's got six meters on it as yep, well. Yeah, it does. And um, it's a pretty sweet rig. It does D-Star. Yeah, it's got D-Star, and uh, does that one have the USB port on the rear there, or it, not? It, uh, yeah, there's USB port back here, so you can plug it up and uh, do uh, uh, BSK31 or whatever straight mm -hmm. from the rig, just like we were doing on a field day. And it'll probably work with that RSBA1 software like I was showing a yeah, little earlier. Absolutely. Uh, and for the antennas, well, you got this little Tar Heel HP here. This is the 6 through 40 meter version. It's good for 500 watts PEP. And this is essentially the same antenna I've got here on my mobile, Tommy. I've got the little Tar Heel 2, which is only 200 watts PEP, but it works from uh, 6 meters down to 80 meters. Mm -hmm. And I've had it for a year now. You know, I bought this at the Huntsville Ham Fest a year ago. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, I've enjoyed it so much that Wayne bought him one at Huntsville this year. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great antenna. Uh, I can't can't say enough about it. Uh, you, you, need put, one, you need you to know. put mine down. Yeah. You Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to get one of these, Tommy, or yeah. else we're not going to let you. Yeah, I know you guys get place. already giving me a hard time. Yeah. Every time I pull up in the driveway over here without that on my truck. Yeah. You really can't be in the club unless you got it. You know, that's <laughs> that's one of those things that you really need. On the other antennas, we've got the Comet CA 2x4 SR. That's a dual band broadband antenna. So it doesn't only cover 2 meters and 440 ham bands. It also covers some of the other frequencies nearby there that you need for transmit and receive capabilities when you're working with public service agencies. It's a great antenna 
for a dual band ham rig plus it gives you that extra coverage as well it's got 3.8 dbi gain on two meters and 6.2 dbi on 70 centimeters and it'll handle 150 watts you're also going to get the cp5m that's a universal lip mount it's got 16 foot six inches of deluxe good low loss cable with it and it installs in only minutes on virtually any lip on a vehicle trunk lids truck rear doors suvs van rear doors hood lips just about any place you can think of on the boot and the boot yes if you're down under the hd5 three quarter 24 is the one that you'll use to mount that screwdriver with it's a heavy duty lip mount with a 3 8 24 threaded socket to accept small screwdriver antennas and anything you know that has that size of uh, mount on it so great prizes there from comet and giga parts you really need to go enter our contest what do they need to do what are our, our rules here on the contest well, first of all you must be a licensed u.s or canadian amateur radio operator with a u.s or canadian shipping address yeah and you can only enter one time per contestant so sending more than one entry is going to disqualify you so if you've already registered don't do it again the winner is responsible for any taxes incurred and the winner agrees to the use of his or her call sign and name in any promotional news items related to the contest. And contestants must not be an employee or affiliate of Amateur Logic, ICOM, MFJ Enterprises, Gigaparts, or Comet. Send an email to contest2014 at amateurlogic.tv with only your call sign in the subject line. Include your name, call sign, class of license, and address and the email message register between now and wednesday october the 8th of 2014. Uh, for winner selection the contest winner will be selected by random number from the entries received the winner will be announced on october the 15th of amateur logic next month's show we'll be giving this away yeah some, somebody's going to have a pretty nice uh i guess they'll get it in time for uh halloween yeah just in time for halloween <laughs> <laughs> if the winning entry doesn't meet the qualification requirements then we'll just draw again using the same method. And you can get all the contest rules and information from amateurlogic.tv slash contest. And we're giving away a couple of other Constellation prizes too, aren't we? Yeah, we are. The second place winner is going to get a polo shirt. Um, well, actually, I don't have it on the polo shirt tonight. But no, you've seen you us wearing them on the show before. Mm -hmm. And uh, Are they getting yours or mine? Uh, it depends on what size they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll get a fresh, clean uh, polo shirt that's going to come to you from our uh, our swag store. I was going to get my wife to wash it. You were? Yeah. No, we'll, we'll give them a fresh okay, one. Okay, we'll give them a new one. Amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. Yeah, that's where you can get these stylish t-shirts here. You know, yeah. they, they keep popping up at the ham fest. Yeah, that's kind of cool, too. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I wish somebody's got one. You guys keep representing. Yeah, and for third price for price third, third price winner is going to get a, a t-shirt one just like one of the ones we have yeah and uh, you can pick the color or the size yeah or the color and the size or both yeah yeah so go enter contest 2014 at amateurlogic.tv and you could win somebody's going to win it because they're not going to let us keep it yep and uh, yeah, somebody's going to be really excited when they get it. I know. So uh, I'd really like to keep it myself, but it just can't happen. Yeah, yeah, can't happen. Maybe you'll get to keep one of those one day. Maybe I'll get to keep one too. That sure would look nice in my mobile out there. Yeah. Although I'm still enjoying my seven thousand. You know. That, yeah. That really rules. Yeah. You know, I got a fifty-one hundred since the last you time do. we were here. Yeah. I got to get it put in my truck. I've been using it in the house for a while, yeah. getting it set up, getting used to it. So. How you like it? Oh, I love it. I right. love it. Yeah. I thought to get, uh, you know, we had the shoot out here and we played with it. And I thought the touch screen, even though it worked nice, I thought it was going to have a little trouble transition to it. But no, mm -hmm. it was just natural to use it out. Wow. Very nice. I love it. And I can see it without these. You could? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I can see, I can see it fine without my glasses. Wow. Well, I kind of want one of those. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous, you know. Yeah. What, the glasses? No, not the glasses. You can keep them. I'll just take the rig. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got uh, another event to tell you about here. I'm going to do an interview on the Newsline Net on uh, the Do Drop In 
conference coming up here on September 27th at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. You know, they have a news line net on uh, Star Do Drop In Star, node number 355-800, every Saturday night at 8 p.m. And they, right. Dave asked me if I'd come in and uh, do an interview with them. So I don't know what questions they're going to ask me. But oh, so you're going to be on the receiving end of the interview. Yes, I think. I think that's how it's going to be. Cool. You know, but anyway, uh, great bunch of guys there. Same ones who host the Amateur Logic Net for us each month. Yeah, they got a really active uh, uh, conference server out there for Echo Links. Pretty they do. cool. If you got some free time, you was, you know want to get on, think around and hear something. Mm -hmm. It's uh, always something going on there. Yeah, and and do try to show up on September 27th at 8 p.m. because I'm gonna feel a little embarrassed if nobody's there to hear my interview. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll show up and ask yeah. some questions for you. Yeah. Also, I'm gonna <laughs> be at Pacificon uh, this year. Be my first year ever to go out there. Yeah, and that's, no, I'm jealous of that one. Yeah, that one's going to be a lot of fun, and I just found out in the last couple of days that they want me to do one of the forums out there. So I've got to come up with a plan on that. Oh, that should be fun. Yeah, I, I, it, it is going to be a blast, mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And looking forward to that event as well. You know, we have a <laughs> monthly net for Amateur Logic over at Do Drop In, and that's uh, going to be, when is it, Tommy? I always ask oh, you. Let's pop it up there so we can see. You think I should? Yeah. Well, it looks to me like it's going to be September the 22nd at 8.30 Central Time. Yep. Central Daylight Time. Not Central, Central Daylight Time. time. Yeah, not Central Time. And uh, that's on the Do Drop In Conference Server, Star Do Drop In Star. or That's Node 355-800. You've got it memorized now. Man, I'll never forget 355-800. Yeah. It sounds like a phone number, but it's not. Yeah. I don't know. It reminds me of some commercial for a carpet company in Chicago for some reason. Yeah. You know, they had a singing phone number. I remember okay. that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, mark that on your calendars and, and uh, tell your friends and let's see if we can get the, the numbers up there. We have a good turnout. It's a lot of fun, but I'd like yeah. to get some more people on there. Yeah, we need a few more. we got room for a few more on there. Tell your mom and them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I did the DV Mega thing last month. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Goose, I, I probably butcher his name every time I say yeah. it like that, but you know who I'm talking about. The guy that made the DV Mega, he, he told me that they have a couple of uh, reflectors dedicated to the DV Mega. If you want to get on there, they're talking about them a lot if you have questions or setting it up or whatever. But it's a DCS005-G and DCS006-G. I haven't been on there yet, but I'm going to try to check those yeah, out. Cool. But, uh, well, we hope you've had as much fun as we have on this episode, and we hope you'll all join us again next month. And, you know, I think I think maybe we'll have an extra episode at the uh, end of this month, too, Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. Some, uh, well, we won't tell you what it is. We'll leave you in suspense. But, uh, well, if I'm I can, in suspense. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't really know what it is either, do you? <laughs> this is news to me too. I can't yeah. hardly wait to see what we're gonna do. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for being here, everyone. Seven three, and we'll see you again next month, yep, or seven, at the end of this month. Yep, seventy three. Seventy three, some down under. This year is the 70th anniversary of the VOA Bethany transmitter site, uh, and to commemorate the 70th, uh, this year will be the 70th anniversary of the VOA Bethany transmission site, and to commemorate the 70th, I can't say it, man, 70th, 70th. This year will be the 70th anniversary of the VOA Bethany transmission site, and to commemorate the 70th. <laughs> Here.
Why don't, why don't you do this? <clears throat> Maybe we ought to start the cameras, huh? Well, I've already started mine, so. Uh, trunk lids, uh, truck door, or trunk. <laughs> so mainly the guys, I think, over in Hawaii, uh, Ohio. <laughs> And you really need to go enter our contest. The way you can do that is you go to, uh, maybe I should hit the right buttons. That'll work. 